let me just set the kind of uh, mood for you. I was probably somewhere between 19 and 20 years old. Um, I had quit college and had started acting on a whim. Um, I had been fired off a TV show and hired into a horror movie. Um, it turned out to be incredibly successful, although I hate horror movies and never liked them ever. Here I was in one. It became very successful very quickly. Um, it then spawned a slew of these sort of teenage slasher movies, of which I was cast often as the heroine of the piece. Um, and as the first film I did, I got paid $8,000, $2,000 a week. Um, and so as the you know, horror films kind of continued, I started to make a little bit of money. Now, a little bit of money, it sounds maybe like a lot of money, but I started incrementally making a little more money. And in the middle of all of this, uh, got, I got this call that they were going to make this film in Australia with a director who was the Alfred Hitchcock of Australia. That's how he was, you know, sold to me. Um, and that Stacy Keach was going to do it and that they had wanted me to play this part. And that's really how um, I got involved. I remember the paycheck wasn't bad. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was certainly more than... Um, it was certainly decent. It was a chance to go to Australia, a place I'd never been. I didn't look at it as a step up in my sophistication, if you will. Um, I, there was some, I mean, the script was decent, and, you know, there was some pleasantness about it. There, there were certainly elements about it that were good. But for a young actor, I, honestly, I... I I still don't understand how young actors sit there choosing the work they do. Just never was my gig. My gig was, I got the job, I go do the job, and it didn't really matter. To be perfectly honest, there was no, there was nothing objectionable about it. It was cleverly written. Stacy was uh, uh, regarded as an actor of, you know, real talent, and so therefore it was not working with somebody who was just a, you know, he was a legitimately good guy and very talented actor. And so, go to Australia, get paid. Hey, <laughs> you know, great, let's go. What was fascinating about the movie, it was the only time I've ever done this, is that the entire movie moved through the Nullarbor Plain. And what was fascinating is that along this road are these weird little, what, what we would call a strip mall. In America, you know, these kind of motel sixes where there's 10 rooms in a motel, a bar, and maybe a restaurant, and then nothing <laughs> for a very long time. And the movie company just sort of took these over all the way along. And we all lived together like that. We all socialized together. And so it was kind of an interesting job because you kind of went out and shot, and then at the end of the day, you went back to one of these places out in the middle of nowhere. I don't, I bet you today they don't get cell service out there. You know, then of course there were no cell phones, but there was, I felt very out of touch with anybody or anything. Um, and it was fascinating because you really got to know the crew, uh, because you ate and lived all together and you moved in this weird little caravan. A fascinating experience actually. And I didn't actually go all the way uh, with anyone, by the way. Um, I didn't go all the way to Perth because my character sort of drops off. Some guy drove me in a Jeep from one of our locations across truly the outback to some landing strip where a plane came and took me back to wherever I went either Melbourne or Adelaide or something, and then I went home. So it was at the end of my work on the film. Um, and I remember that as maybe being one of the most kind of exciting, exhilarating, scary moments of my life, driving with this person in a Jeep in the middle of the outback, going to some dirt airfield where some plane was going to pick me up and believing that it would all turn out okay. <laughs> 
I have a couple memories that are very clear. Um, it felt a little more um, pioneery. Um, I remember there was a woman, I'll never forget this, I've done this imitation of her many, many times. I've dined out on this woman. She was something. I don't know if she was a camera. I, she might have been involved in the camera crew. She might have been in the prop crew. She might have been in the sound department. She was a member of our crew. And she smoked hand-rolled cigarettes. And she was kind of a wild woman. She kind of was like one of those pioneer kind of women. And she had this bag of tobacco. It was like a little leather bag with a thing. She had it like attached to her belt or something. And in a gale, in a windy torrent of rain and wind, she with one hand was able to get out a rolling paper, somehow tip this packet of thing with like opening it with her teeth, pouring this stuff and like this rolled a cigarette and then put it in her mouth and lit it up. I, I remember standing there looking, thinking, no, that's not possible. It was incredible. I remember that. It felt very much like that to me. You know, it felt, obviously, we were a road crew, so it felt like we were, it was like a John Ford movie, you know? It felt that way because we were very much this guerrilla desert crew. You know, we played snooker in the bars, and I made the one fatal error um, uh, on a movie, which is you don't beat the key grip or the gaffer or the prop guy in snooker in front of his friends. And I am did. I don't know how, because uh, when the movie was finished, they gave Richard and Barbie as a gift for my crew present, gave me a snooker cue in a wooden uh, case, a you know, nice one with my name on it. I remember there was a weird poem in it that had to do with pigs. Pig in a poke, you better stop shaking today. No, shaken. Today's pig is tomorrow's bacon. You know, there. I remember that. There's a ballet that goes on when you do something technical as an actor. And as an actor, the only thing I want to learn is the technical stuff. So if I'm playing a police officer, for instance, I will go learn what is the physical job of being a police officer. What does it feel like? What is, get the muscle, literal muscle. Stacy did that as a driver. And you know, being a truck driver is a very beautiful, balletic experience because you're going in and out of the truck all the time. And I remember he wanted that fluidity. He wanted that beauty and that elegance of the way that he moved as that guy. And I remember he worked very hard for that. And as a young actor, that was really helpful for me to see because most of the time, you know, what is the physicality of a high school student? You know, I knew what a physicality of a high school student, but here was a guy who was doing a job that he didn't do and, and was, was mastering it um, as an actor, and it was exciting to see. It was really exciting to see. I remember that. He taught me how to live properly on location. Um, he was with his wife. Now, I was this young actress who, you know, they give you per diem, and they put you at a hotel, and of course, all I wanted was like the smallest room at the hotel that would cost the least so that I could save a little of my per diem so that I could have a little more money because I was still. Stacy took the biggest suite and he had trunks. Here's what I remember. He had trunks that he and his wife took on locations and in them were rugs and tapestries and lamps and objet d'ar and things that you would put around your hotel room to make it seem like home. And I thought it was fascinating how much he assimilated uh, into the local and then also brought his own stuff. I, it was kind of a lesson for me in location living. Luckily not something I've ever mastered. It wasn't an Australian story. Um, 
uh, it was a universal story. It just happened to be set uh, in the middle of the outback. But it was it was a you know it was it was basically a, it could be anywhere kind of story. It didn't have to be there. I mean, I felt like I was making an Australian film because I was I I was surrounded by Australians, and I mean, I was it was a you know production company. I mean, I don't think that I felt that I was. I mean, it's better that it's a universal story. It would have been horrible if it had been an Australian story that you just taken two American actors and dropped in just because you got your financing. Oh, it would have been horrible. I mean, it's bad enough that I took the job of another person. I remember feeling badly, feeling horribly that there was this person who was supposed to do this job and then I get brought in to do it. So, um, uh, you know, from a cultural standpoint, Australia has such a rich history and such a beautiful history and violent and scary and, you know, fatal shore history that you know, you can't, uh, the Australian cinema, Picnic at Hanging Rock, for instance, is a, is a great example, um, will, for, you know, obviously keep the history alive. But this was just sort of a generic um, I love the, the kind of uh, categorizing something, uh, you know, thriller, you know, it's like, well, this is a thriller, it's not a this, you know, it's a suspense film. It, obviously, they're going to sell it to get the most people to go, and the way they think they can do so is they're going to exploit it as a film that has a violent element to it. and and. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised. You know, when you're a young actor, you are open-minded, open-hearted. You're, you're, which was, I think, probably why it was a little difficult for me because I am so open and friendly and happy to do my work. I love working. I love the process of making films. I love crews. I love the kind of weird now I understand very dysfunctional family life that's created on them, but I love that. And when you welcome someone into your country, into a different, um, it's a very scary thing to do, to be the sort of token American on something that there is some hostility about. I knew there was hostility about being token American, let alone the fact that I had taken another person's job. And I remember everyone was very kind that my experience in Australia, except for the guy who I beat at snooker and was not happy about it, he actually broke a snooker stick and stormed out, I think he'd had a couple drinks, um, was that people were genuinely, it's a beautiful country. You know, I've subsequently read The Fatal Shore and, you know, other bits of history and, you know, it's a beautiful country with uh, a really rich, um, diverse, group of people and that's the nice memory for me the movie itself no offense you know it's not my kind of cup of tea but the people are and people are what make experiences to me have uh, any lasting value and my experience there was really it's probably why I said I would do this because my experience was that I I felt like this was a good thing and uh, the people were really quite ex extraordinary Road Games was one of the uh, one of the early opportunities for me to visit Australia, and uh, it was in fact it was my first time in Australia. Uh, I received the script, I read it, I spoke with Richard Franklin, who was the director, and he gave me such a a wonderful profile of Alfred Hitchcock, who's always been one of my favorites, and uh, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, who was my co-star was a favorite of mine, so it, it was it was a slam dunk. I mean, I just said, I, I gotta do this. Pat Quid was, uh, he, he was a, a, an American who, sort of a derelict American who found his way to Australia and got a job as a trucker. Um, I think he was a bit of a renegade. Uh, uh, the, the, the wonderful thing that I recall about 
that particular character was his relationship with his dog, Killer. And this dog that they actually chose for me was was uh, he was uh, an Australian Red, I believe. I, I think that's the, the breed. But uh, he wasn't a a, um, uh, a dingo. Uh, I, I've I've been told that it's impossible to domesticate dingoes, and I don't know if that's true or not. I guess the closest they've come to it is, is an Australian Red, but I love that relationship with the dog. That was my favorite part of the, of the movie, actually. It, it was not a traditional truck driver, no, in that respect. I mean, the fact that he, yeah, he had a, a bit of a, he had, he had a very rich fantasy life. I think that if Pat quit, if he, in, in another life, would have probably liked to have been an astronaut. Uh, that, that was kind of my subtext, as I recall, when I was making that. Uh, making the film. Happily, I had had experience driving on the other side of the road when I was in school in England, so I knew how to drive on that side of the road, but I'd never driven a big rig like that before. And I remember the day that we came down to, to uh, practice, to rehearse driving the rig, I was, I was a bit overwhelmed with the fact that you had 16, you had uh, splitters on these gears, so shifting was a very difficult part of the whole experience. And the Pantech, carrying the Pantech in the back, was something I could, I was, I never got very good at, at backing up and, and uh, backing up into the Pantech and getting it hooked, hooked up properly. But I loved doing it. I mean, the feeling of driving a truck that big on the roads in, in Australia gives you such a sense of power and sense of, you know, that you really, you, you are, you, you're king of the road. No That's question okay. about it. When I came down for pre-production to do road games, I, I was at, at the Cannes Film Festival, so I had to fly to Australia, going all the way around the world one way for three days, and then go back to Cannes to finish up uh, with some work I was doing there. I think we, we were presenting uh, Fat City at that time, yeah, and the New Centurions, and then go back to Australia coming around the other way. Well, very happily, the first scene that we shot in Road Games was when Pat Quid had been on the road for 12 or 13 hours and was exhausted. So I didn't have to do any acting. Sleeping in the truck was not only a matter of getting in the mood; it was a matter of exhaustion. <laughs> yeah, because we, are, we we shot long hours, and it was it was very difficult on being on the road and uh, and living in in the actual conditions that a trucker would live in. Pretty much, I know that delirium and hallucinating are very much a part of a truck driver's existence having done research on, at the time, I, I spoke with a lot of different guys who'd driven trucks and, and got that impression from them that, that talking to yourself uh, was a, a way of staying awake because keeping awake and getting to your destination is the objective, that's the goal. You've got to get there and get there on time. Get those piggies to market, as Pat Quid said, you know. Um, and I, the reason I probably don't recall it was because I was probably in that mode myself at the time. Um, delirium and, and, and is a very dangerous part of truck driving, no question about it. And I remember Richard saying, okay, well, now we, we, he was sort of telling me what was going to happen as we were driving down the road where the, the lines of the of the lines of the, of the highway would converge and sort of meld into one another. And, and then I remember him saying, he said, and now a kangaroo is gonna come up in front of the truck and scare the living daylights out of you. And so those things were all done on my side of the camera. When they turned around and shot the actual, the actual kangaroo, I wasn't around for that. But I remember seeing, when I saw the film, I thought it really worked, it came together beautifully. One of the, uh, the most interesting things for me was driving from Adelaide to Perth across the Nullarbor Plain, which is, of course, I mean, it, it was an extraordinary experience. And on the way, as we were driving, we, we got hit with a plague of caterpillars. I'll never forget it. This entire, this green mass all over the road. We had to be very careful because it's very slippery, actually. And it was at night. We were, we were moving the crew from one location to another. And uh, that was one of my first experiences with, with an Australian plague. We, we sort of stayed for about a week in, in a place called Eucla. And we, we stayed in, uh, in, in gas stations with saltwater showers. So the living conditions were not 
you know, they were, they were pretty rough. But one, one day, we decided we'd go off and, um, we, had, we had some time off, we'd go off and romp around in the sand dunes. And I came back and I, I, I remember telling the assistant director that they said, where, where have you been, mate? I said, we just ran off and we were running around in the sand dunes. And they, this ashen look came over their, their faces. They said, you, you know, that's very dangerous because there are death adders in these sand dunes. And that's why you don't see anybody around there, because I didn't know that. Um, another great experience, Grant Page said, you know what we have to do? We have to go and visit an aboriginal camp. And so we decided one day, Grant said, okay, we're going to, he, he, he selected the camp and he said, as we walk in, we're going to play harmonicas. If we play music, they'll feel very much at home and, they'll, and we'll be much more welcome. We won't be uh, intimidating. And it was a great experience, and they were, they were wonderful. I mean, they, we came into their camp, they welcomed us, they showed us around. And my wife, at the time, had a mirror that they wanted, because that's how they catch wombats, apparently. They shine these mirrors, get the, the light to shine just down in the hole of the wombat, and that gets the wombat to come up, and that's how they get them. So this mirror was, a, was, a, was something that was of great value to them, and uh, my wife gave it to them, yeah. It was frontier filmmaking. Uh, as I said, we, 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 stayed, we had saltwater showers, we stayed in gas stations, we, we, uh, there were no motels. It was a great relief when we finally got to Perth and were, were able to sort of get back in, you know, I remember we, we had to take a, the first clean water shower was a great relief. but. Uh, when you're making a film like that, I, I think it actually it actually helps to be in those kind of environments. It, it you know it kept us in character and kept us in the spirit of the movie. If we were living in first-class hotels and were driven out to the set every day, I think it would have had a different, a whole different feel to it. So I think it was very much uh, it, it really contributed to the effect of the film. This is the thing that really impressed me about working in Australia were, were the crews. I, 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 was ex I was really impressed with the quality of the workmanship. It was uh, not only the, the, uh, the special effects, the camera work. Uh, I remember this crazy, wonderful stunt uh, coordinator, Grant Page, who I think is somewhat of a legend in Australia, uh, designing uh, um, a, a stunt that required a great deal of physics because it, it, it was a truck that had to go up in the air in a very small alley, the cab of a truck, and land on top of a car. And he, he was sure that he could do this with ramps and everything. Well, amazingly enough, he, he actually made it, he, he got it to happen. I, I thought it was, gonna, it was gonna be impossible. But I don't know that an American could have done that at that particular point in time. Richard Franklin is, um, it was an extraordinary experience. He, he's, he, he, first of all, I think he's, he knows more about Alfred Hitchcock than just about any man in the world. And uh, having gone to school at SC, SC Film School, I know that he had uh, he graduated from there. And he knew every single shot, every single frame of every single Alfred Hitchcock movie. And I think much of Road Games emulates uh, the Alfred Hitchcock style. Yeah, he was, he was very affable and, and uh, absolutely charming uh, and wonderfully precise in terms of how he wanted each scene to be presented. And uh, it, was a great, it was a great experience working with him. Jamie Lee is a great, great gal. I mean, she's not only a wonderful actress, she's got a great sense of humor. She's very affable and uh, very accessible. And I, she's just a lot of fun to, to work with. Um, uh, it was early in her career. She had done a couple of, I think she, she, had she was just about that time was being touted as the queen of scream movies. I think she'd done Halloween, I think, or Halloween one and two. I think she did two Halloween movies. But uh, this was quite a distance before she did uh, some of her better work in, in uh, um, later years, yeah. The fact that Janet Lee was her mom and was a, uh, of course, the most, probably the most famous scene in all of Hitchcock's movies was one of the most famous scenes in the shower, the shower scene. So there was that legacy that it was, it was, she was carrying on that legacy for sure. Australian films uh, had, really, had really not penetrated the American market uh, at the time we made road games. And one of the difficulties we had when we were down there uh, was 
the, the quota system, which exists both in England and Canada and the United States, whereby uh, American actresses and actors are not often um, welcomed uh, if they're taking jobs away from Australian actors. And I remember Jamie Lee Curtis had a difficult time during that period because uh, they thought that an Australian actress could have played the role. Well, nobody could have played the role better than Jamie Lee, but I remember one, one day, uh, Jamie came up to my hotel suite and she was in tears, or almost in tears, because there was an article in, in the newspaper saying that uh, basically, why are we hiring Miss Curtis when we could be hiring an Australian actress? And they, they did treat her pretty badly at that time. It was, a, it was, not, a, it was not a very hospitable thing to, you know, to, to do. Had Jamie Lee been Jamie, the Jamie Lee of today after, you know, after some huge hit movies, uh, I don't think she would have been treated the same way at all. But at that particular time in her career, she was, uh, she was a star, but nevertheless, she wasn't as big a star as she is today. Jamie Lee is such a professional, uh, I mean, she was disappointed and upset about it, but she, she, she got over it, and, and got right into the, got right into the project and did her work. Yeah, we were all upset about it, but we forgot about it and went on did our, you know, did our work. The concept of two Americans meeting in the middle of the Australia desert is is a, it's a bit of a coincidence. There's no question about it, but I, it worked. I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that, that that's where the attraction comes. As a matter of fact, that. That, get that kind of synchronicity and serendipity happens uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, those things happen in life, and um, that's what the script called for, and uh, that's what happened. I think Road Games is very much an Australian film. I mean, certainly as an American. I, mean, I don't think it could have been shot in any place else. I don't think, uh, I mean, uh, the, you don't see kangaroos in Texas. Uh, you, you, you know, we could have been, yes, I, I guess story-wise, the, the, the events of the plot could have taken place on any road, anywhere, in any desert. But the fact that it was in Australia gave the, a certain character to the film that I don't think you could, have, you could have gotten anywhere else in the world. I was so impressed with uh, the topography of of Australia, particularly the, the Great Australian Bite. It was just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. It's like being at the end of the earth. You think you're, you've, re you've really reached the, the last outpost of civilization. It, uh, it's almost otherworldly. The, the great expanse that you have in Australia, the, the, the huge vistas that you have, the beautiful scenery, I don't think, uh, you could capture that anywhere else. And so from my point of view, it very much uh, reflected Australian culture. I, I can see from an Australian point of view where it might be regarded as an outback western. I always thought of it more of as a thriller or in the, certainly in the mystery genre. Uh, the the uh, who is Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, who is that mysterious character? And of course, the end of the movie, which I think is one of the most uh, interesting parts of the film was shot after we finished principal photography. It was, it was put in it afterwards where you're not sure if that's a dead body in the back or if it's a dead pig. Yeah, that, was, uh, that was a Richard Franklin touch that was in post-production. But while we were on the road, it was difficult. It was, a very, it was difficult because we were moving and moving and shooting in simultaneously. And uh, that was hard. Richard was very diplomatic with the actors. He never told us that there was there were, that there were any problems with budget or schedule or time. So I was never privy to any of the uh, of what was going on in that particular uh, in that last moment. Uh, I had no idea that there were those kind of problems. I know that that he uh, he did express his concern about uh, not being able to bring everybody together. But I thought it was because some of the actors had other things to do and they were off on, you know, doing other things. I didn't have any, I didn't know that it had anything to do with the fact that we were over budget. I recall shooting the, uh, the truck going through the alleyways. Very, very, yes, and I remember that we literally, it was very difficult because there was very little room on either side to maneuver the truck. So it, uh, much of that was, I remember Grant Page 
very concerned about exactly where we were going to set the truck in order to make that stunt work, where the truck would go up and go on top of the car. Yeah, uh, and it was difficult. It was very hard because that those trucks are they're, they're much bigger than I mean uh, than. Uh, in fact, I think that one of the original alleyways that we had selected to shoot the, the, that particular sequence, we had to scrap it because it wasn't it wasn't wide enough. The truck was actually wider than the alley itself. The boat stunt is probably one of the most extraordinary uh, stunts in the film, uh, and I remember, I recall. The day, they worked on this for days, literally before they shot it, because you know, when you're going to destroy a boat on film, uh, you only have one chance. It had to be right. And I know there were a number of cameras burning at that particular time, but there was also a tremendous amount of preparation for that stunt. And it went off, thank goodness, without a hitch. Cock. <laughs> I thought that the, the marketing of the film, when the film came out, I, I was disappointed because I felt that the film was really a thriller. It was really a mystery. And uh, I, I didn't get the sense that, that it, it was being marketed that way. It was being marketed more of as, uh, as an adventure film and, and without much emphasis on, on the, the elements of, of, uh, of mystery. And, and um, I was disappointed. For some reason, the, uh, the whole concept of of dealing with the story and the mystery and the uh, aspect was was abandoned. It was, uh, but you know, in, in movies, uh, what do they say? They say that uh, there's only two things that work, and you know, it's more sex and violence, and more sex and violence. That's, I mean, that's those are the things that uh, murder, rape, and mayhem are the only things that really are, are you know sell in movies, at least at that particular point in time. And um, I tend to disagree. I loved, uh, I loved what I, 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 the film when I saw it. I, I really, I thought Richard did a great job. I thought the editing was extraordinary, and I thought the performances were very good. I also liked the music. I thought the music added a great deal, you know, to the film. And also, uh, the, the, the final scene. I think really the addition of that final scene, you know, made a great difference in terms of the final impact of the film. Yeah, I was very pleased with it, and I loved the character. It was uh, one of my favorite characters in my early career. I said to Everett, you know, one of the things about scripts is that you can judge how long the film's going to be by how many pages the script is. And so I want you to uh, type it in the style of a proper script. I made an error, however, and gave him a Hitchcock script. And Hitchcock scripts tended to run 20 or 30 pages longer than anyone else's. As a consequence, the first cut of Patrick was very long. But Everett went away with the script of Rear Window, which I gave him, and came back with an idea for Rear Window set in a truck. And I thought it was a fantastic idea. But I didn't realise that at the time Everett was writing the ABC series Truckies. And by the time I'd finished Patrick and said, now let's do Rear Window in a truck, he said, oh, uh, well, uh, uh, there is a bit of a problem. Uh, fortunately, um, Oscar Whitbread was a friend, and when I told Oscar the story, he said, oh, we'll give you the rights to it. And frankly, our Road Games doesn't resemble the Road Games episode of Truckies. Road Games was written for Sean Connery, and uh, only after it was finished did I find out how much Sean Connery cost and realised that it was not possible to raise that kind of money, let alone surround it with what one would expect in a Sean Connery movie. So uh, we uh, asked Avco, our US distributor, um, who would be acceptable to them, and they came up with a list, and uh, Stacy Keach was on the list, and uh, I liked him a lot, and, uh, and we went out and discovered we could afford him. I used Jamie Lee Curtis because I had met her via John Carpenter on the set of The Fog. She was almost unknown at the time. Halloween was a big success, but I don't know that people knew who the leading lady was, at least not then. Uh, but I had a way of getting to Jamie through John. And, uh, and so when 
suddenly Avco decided Stacey wasn't enough and they wanted an American girl in that part as well, um, I went after Jamie. To be fair, we had cast an Australian in the, in the part of Hitch and then Avco changed their mind and I had to appear to change my mind. Nowadays, that would not be looked down upon because everybody accepts the role of the distributor in terms of marketing a film and packaging a film, but in those days they didn't. And we got ourselves in this extraordinary situation where the Melbourne office had approved something and the Sydney office hadn't, or vice versa. And uh, it was difficult to figure out uh, what was going on. We did have one comment about, uh, we were obviously bringing in Jamie Lee Curtis because she was uh, the daughter of our executive producer. Uh, Bernard Schwartz, who happened to have the same name as Tony Curtis's real name, and uh, I made the comment fairly obviously Equity based their decisions on fantail rappers. I wasn't there, but quite early in her stay here, Jamie was taken to Sydney for a screening of The Fog at the Sydney Film Festival, and somebody asked her the question, I don't know how publicly it was asked, what is it like putting Australians out of work? Now, I don't think it upset her that much, but she certainly didn't feel as welcome as I would have liked her to feel when she got back to the desert for her first shot. The, the chase with the boat was uh, something I was pretty proud of. I was knocked out by Mad Max, as was the rest of the world, and I said to George Miller, how do you do that? He said, just look at Ben-Hur. So I looked at the chariot race in Ben-Hur and I got the, uh, the wheels of the truck rubbing on the boat and various other things. It's, it, it owes a lot to, uh, to Ben-Hur and to George. Um, and one of my favorite moments is the mast sticking into the desert at the end, which we had to do surreptitiously because we were running over budget. And so I sent a, a, a sort of uh, ad hoc second unit down the road to uh, to set up for that scene and sneaked away during a, uh, a coffee break and and directed it uh, without the completion guarantors who were on set realizing. I did a kind of a graph of the film in terms of where all its high points were and I discovered there was a, a moment there where we were the high points were a bit far apart so I totally arbitrarily added this kangaroo that, that, that jumped out of nowhere and looked like the devil and um, I didn't prepare Everett for that and when he came to the screening he said where the hell did that kangaroo come from and go to? Uh, you could just as easily have had the kangaroo pick up the, uh, the truck and eat it and make the rest of the film about the pursuit of the giant kangaroo. Uh, but um, we didn't do that. I was particularly proud of the scene where Stacy argues with himself uh, in the truck in that a lot of it was done on the ADR stage. And that had a lot to do with Stacy and his uh, intellectual abilities. Uh, once he got the idea of having an argument with himself, he really went with it and to say it was ad-libbed is true but it was much more than that and I'm very pleased with that scene. In fact that's one of my favourite scenes and I didn't realise it was Quentin's. Road Games was shot at a time that was a little politically fraught in that a number of English union people had come out here to show us how to run uh, our film sets and among other things they introduced the tea break, which I discovered when I worked in England, had already gone out in England. But uh, we discovered when we got to the desert that uh, we had limited light out there. So we had a 10 hour day, but only something like eight hours of actual shooting time. And when you took a lunch break and two tea breaks, and when the tea breaks were calculated, uh, on the basis of the last person to get a cup of tea, and it was 10 minutes from that point, they would work out to be half an hour at a time. So my shooting day was down to something like six hours, 
and it made it very tough. It was, however, a tough shoot for the crew in that the weather wasn't good on the Nullarbor plane. It rained a lot, believe it or not, and, uh, and by the time we got back to town, we were all quite tired, and, uh, and then we went into something like 15 straight night shoots, which I would never attempt again. Well, that combined with this new unionistic attitude, and suddenly uh, they were having stop work meetings, going through the storyboard saying, you need this, you need this, you need this, but you don't need this, this, this and this, and we won't shoot this and we'll give you four takes of this and no more. We'll give you one take of this and it was awful. Well, I made a mistake that Raoul Walsh would never have made in that he always said he shot the toughest scenes early in the shoot to get them out of the way. Well, our finale uh, was a much more elongated chase uh, and the gag was that it got slower and slower. Well, unfortunately, we had got slower and slower in our shoot and we were about two days behind and the completion guarantors given that we were the first Australian film to have them, uh, got really uh, tough and told us we couldn't run over. And the only way to pick up the time was to start cutting the finale. All of the characters reappear suddenly at the end of Road Games because each of them had a new scene to intro introduce them, which got cut. And there was one scene of which I was particularly fond uh, and Frida Frugal had hitched a ride with Sneezy Rider and, uh, and she came riding in on the pillion seat and uh, just in time to almost crash into the truck in a very spectacular stunt in which they were going to slide between the wheels of the, uh, of the, of the truck and uh, Grant had that all worked out mathematically so no one could get hurt. Obviously that would have been doubles, but that was going to be one of the great scenes of the finale and we never shot it. We planned it and staged it and rehearsed it and they pulled the plug on it. We were the first Australian film to have a completion guarantor and Film Finances, the British company, who are highly respected worldwide, were the company and uh, and they were using the kind of bullying tactics that most international producers would not have bowed to uh, but we did and I remember running into Richard Soames years later and saying gee you were tough on us on road games and he said well we never thought you'd take us seriously as it turns out we could have shot those extra two days and not made a claim against film finances but we didn't understand the mathematics I remember the cultural exactitude argument and I remember hearing that Philip Adams had filibustered at a Film Victoria meeting about the fact that I might be getting the truck to drive on the wrong side of the road. Certainly would have made for some good scenes I suppose but uh, uh, I didn't think that was anything to do with our culture. You know, We uh, fought at Eureka for the right to drive on the other side of the road. I, you know, I don't know. Anyway, we put the film up to a Film Victoria meeting that Philip was absent from and it went through. There was certainly uh, some nasty press at the time the film was released and it all related to the importation of Jamie Lee Curtis and the whole uh, question of importing actors. Um, as I say, that has gone away now, but on the morning after the film opened, there was a front page editorial saying Yankee go home, telling me that I was a would-be American and would do well to go to America, so I did. It seems to me nowadays everyone makes calling card films to show the international market what they can do. Uh, that was certainly a factor that I had in my mind when I was making Patrick and Road Games was that they would be appreciated internationally and that I might get a chance to work internationally, which of course I did, uh, but that wasn't the primary motive for making the films. I made them because they were films I wanted to make and I thought audiences would like them and they've certainly stood the test of time. I think the powers that be would begrudgingly agree that I'm a half-decent craftsman um, and I doubt that it's more than that now. 
uh, Quentin Tarantino's recent publicity hasn't hurt, um, and I didn't pay Quentin, I've never even met him, um, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know that with the exception of John Morris, who headed the FFC at one point, uh, I've ever been taken that seriously as an Australian director, not by comparison to Peter Weir, Bruce Beresford and co. I think it's harder to make genre films now than it was then. We kind of slipped under the wire. There was talk about exactitude and so on, but there was a, a sense that there might have been you know, some need to make a variety of, of different kinds of films. And it may be that the new funding body uh, says that that's what they want to do, but my experience on visitors was that uh, uh, they were very opinionated about genre without really any knowledge of genre filmmaking and uh, it really damaged the film and my career. I felt back then that we were pioneering something and there were not as many rules but the longer the bureaucracy has been in place the more they've been able to come up with sets of rules and books of rules and uh, the more they apply those the harder it gets. I'd always been intrigued by the idea that when you go on a long road trip you'll pass somebody and then later on they'll pass you and it's like this this traveling community and uh, we kind of like the idea that you get to know these people as if they're all in a, a rear rear window situation all in one apartment building but in this case we're all on the road moving towards a, a common destination you know the the null of war I think was was very impressive you know just the sheer loneliness of it sheer nothingness of it um, kind of captivated us both and we were also very influenced at the time by Stephen Sondheim's uh, Sweeney Todd uh, and that the idea that someone could <coughs> butcher people and yet still be the, the sympathetic protagonist in a film. As I recall, I think Richard and I might have been working on it as, as a screenplay idea and nothing ever came of it and the Truckies series came along and so I used that that plot in a truckies uh, and later found out that the ABC doesn't hold on to copyright so that we were able to uh, rework the script and and finally do it as, as a feature well of course in in the truckies series there were there were two of them in the truck so they had some somebody to, you know they could speak to each other in the feature film there's only the Stacy Keach character so we had to give him a dog to to talk to uh, but I, I kind of like the idea of, you know, two truckies and on, on a long trip and what do they talk about and they make stupid jokes and play stupid games and, and so forth. And to have this, this sort of lighthearted feel uh, against a backdrop of extreme violence. I think Richard sensed that if, that if, um, if he left the country for any given period, then I would, <clears throat> I would get distracted with something else. So he actually brought me over to... Uh, Fiji when they were shooting Blue Lagoon. And this is another, the adventures I've had with, with Richard. Because uh, that was a phenomenal experience being, being uh, on that location. Uh, and yet I wasn't working on the film, so you know, I had plenty of free time. And yes, I was working on, on road games, and I can remember you know, sitting cross-legged on the beach with a little typewriter, uh, banging out the scenes. and, and uh, at certain times, I would be uh, on the main island in Fiji, and they would be off on the location island. And Richard would ring up every day by satellite phone or something and want to know exactly what I'd done that day. And uh, 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 yeah, I mean, what a wonderful place to, to sit and write. Oh, I think Sean Connery was mentioned originally. Uh, I wrote it very much with Sean Connery in mind. I didn't know Stacy at the time, and I didn't know, uh, you know, Jamie Lee wasn't very well known at the time. This is at a point where Australia was very sensitive about bringing in 
overseas actors. And of course, Jamie Lee wasn't particularly well known at the time. Um, and uh, I think it kind of left a sour taste in everyone's mouth. Uh, Jamie Lee's a wonderful girl. Uh, and I, I believe at one point she was in tears because she just didn't feel welcome in the country. She'd been brought in to do a, a job and, and uh, uh, people were making the most awful comments about, you know, what are you doing putting Australians out of work and so forth. Um, it was all just part of this identity crisis that Australia seems to be going through. Richard always kept me very aware of su suspense, the rules of suspense, and you know, analyzing each scene to 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 make sure that worked. Uh, as I said before, I you know, I learned a great deal about the construction of suspense through him and going through each each scene to get maximum suspense out of it. The uh, the kangaroo with ping pong ball eyes and so forth. It's just purely a, a shock. And because the driver is kind of semi-hallucinating anyway, it, it, it fit well into the story. As I said, I mean, we, I had to really uh, exercise the imagination to come up with uh, ways of keeping this guy interesting, sitting in a truck all alone for most of the movie. Uh, but the, uh, the kangaroo thing was, was uh, one of the things that Richard came, just came up with on the location, I think. I think just at the time there was a huge sensitivity about cultural identity and the, the fact that we were making films that were finally being shown internationally and just w you know what should we be portraying. The, the sensitivity, I remember a, a script I had written uh, and because most of my scripts end up in LA anyway, I'd used words like sidewalk, you know, an elevator. and. Uh, this was rejected by one of the funding bodies, and I went back and did another draft of the script, and all I did was turn sidewalk into footpath and, and elevator into lift and throw in a couple of kangaroos, and it passed. They said, yeah, this is much more Australian. So that's how superficial it was at the time. I think as far as Richard and I were concerned, we were just making films, we weren't trying to be particularly American or, or anything else. Uh, the fact that they were done in Australia and the fact that the cars actually drove on the left-hand side of the road instead of the right uh, was, was, was a breakthrough in itself. You know, it, it, it wasn't a, a particularly good time uh, in, in Australian film as far as um, the, this identity crisis, which is, is, is still going on, I suppose, to some extent. But in those days, because of 10BA and because of, of the newness of it all, it was just under a, uh, you know, under a microscope. And the, you know, the critics went to town on it, yeah. I, I was pretty happy with it, really. Uh, uh, I thought Stacy and, and Jamie did a, a terrific job. Uh, visually, I, I, I thought it looked great. It was just uh, in, in, in the same areas that, that Richard would probably criticize it, that there just wasn't enough time to do certain things uh, on the scale that we wanted to do them. Uh, just missed opportunities. But I, I, you know, I think given, given the budget and the constraints that he was under, uh, I, I thought it turned out very well and, and still holds up fairly well uh, to this day, which not all of my films do. Road Games was a very, very logistically different, difficult shoot. And not only the shooting of it, but so much travelling had to be done. Uh, we started shooting the film in Melbourne and shot all the way to Perth. So that great components of the schedule were taken up, which is moving things across the desert and stuff. Um, and as always, the, film, the schedule wasn't long enough. Richard wasn't, wasn't a great uh, fan of tea breaks, I must say, which is something that was left over from, from the English way of making films, which is like you have the sacred tea break. But I don't think we're inf as inflexible as that. I don't think that in the middle of a take or in the middle of a shot, the crew would have just gone to have tea. That's not how it works here. But you do sometime in the morning get a tea break, uh, unlike the American system where you just have craft services pouring on the stuff all the time and you 
disappear and grab stuff. In Australian crews at the time, you just ha stopped and had a tea break, but it was fairly flexible. But I think the real problem was that there was never enough time to shoot road games. And a lot of it was the fact that we had to move from Melbourne all the way to Perth. And so we're trying to shoot and travel a crew literally across the continent. And that eats enormously into your schedule. And from a director's point of view, there's never enough time to do all the coverage you want anyway. So you can imagine how it would grate for Richard to have to stop while the crew have some sticky buns and tea. I remember there were a lot of scheduling problems on the shoot and it basically there wasn't enough time to travel and shoot, everything had to be shot. Richard was a director trying to get the shots in the can that he needed to tell his story. Um, from his point of view, these shots are essential and uh, whether you say it's inflexible or not, he has a commitment to tell the story. And if it goes a little bit over schedule, a little bit over budget, that is someone else's problem. So, but there can be conflicts when essentially the film didn't have a long enough schedule. Uh, the final chase on the film wasn't as long as we had storyboarded. It didn't end up being shot. And I know that as, as uh, we ran over schedule, uh, the completion guarantors started to lean very heavily on us to cut back on the schedule. Um, one of the problems we did have, I think, is that we were shooting the film essentially chronologically. So toward the end of the shoot, um, the sequences at the end of the script are the ones that get shortchanged. Uh, and as obviously we ran over schedule, they were the sequences that perhaps weren't enough production value put into them. And that would, that would figure, yes, I would imagine that Richard didn't get enough of his end chase sequence. I, I can recall that there was a bit of controversy about uh, Jamie Lee Curtis being brought in and replacing an Australian actress. And also there was Stacey Keach as well. I mean, there wasn't just one overseas American actor, there were two. Uh, and this didn't go down very well with Australian actors as well. Um, whether she was she specifically replaced uh, uh, Lisa Piers, I'm not. I don't know. But Jamie Lee at the time was the goddess of that genre, the Queen of Scream. Um, it would have been fa it's fantastic to have got Jamie Lee in an Australian film of that genre and Stacey Keach as well. I mean, if, if you're a financier looking at overseas sales, this is uh, this is gold. Richard uh, went to film school in the United States and his heart, part of his heart is always in America and he's a great admirer of American films um, and he was drawn to that genre. I mean, I, I remember that, that when, we, when we talked about the, the style of the film, he was looking at films like North by Northwest. This is which way he gravitated for inspiration. A lot of the Australian film industry at the time was using French and European films for inspiration. So from their point of view, they were quite disdainful about films like Road Games because it's a classic road movie, road thriller movie, of which the Americans were tuning out a lot of, which North by Northwest is one, but this wasn't the sort of genre of films that were uh, well regarded in Australia at the time. I think possibly a lot of the controversy was they saw this as a copy of an American film and disregarding the fact that a lot of the other stuff we did were copies of European films. I mean, all the films we were doing were inspired and were derivative from other industries. We were just starting off. Um, but Richard did get a hammering and I think that, that um, it left a sour taste in his mouth. I think that, that, that critics couldn't get used to the fact that, that some filmmakers were making films that they saw as exclusively American genre. And um, I, I don't think they gave Richard, for example, the credit that he should have got in the same way that they didn't give George Miller at the beginning credit for Mad Max. When Mad Max was first released in this country, many of our uh, prestigious critics slammed it. Now they've come around, of course it's a masterpiece, but at the time it was considered to be some crappy Corman bikey movie. Um, and that's what's as regarded. I mean, you know, Corman does these biking movies. What are we doing doing biking movies? Um, and it's amazing how everybody's changed their point of view, but at the time it was considered slumming it. My favourite sequence in the film is the sequence where Stacy goes into the back of the trailer with the swinging pig carcasses. But I'm talking from a point of view of cinematography. Uh, 
because the game there was how dark could we make this and yet still use it on the screen. And, and seeing the restoration of it again recently, I quite particularly was impressed by that. I think, my gosh, I don't know if I could do that again. It was very brave and audacious. But the whole sequence there around at night, around that sequence, is the one that particularly I, I enjoy watching. Not the landscapes. I'm very, you know, landscapes are landscapes, very easy to do. This was just a little scary, spooky sequence in the back of a refrigerated trailer truck. I was the assistant director on road games and the script was way over length <clears throat> and uh, I thought we needed a 12-week shoot to complete it. And uh, I sat down with Richard and said, unless we can work out what the shots are very accurately, um, I think we need this extra time. Anyway, um, we sat down for a couple of days and we didn't get very far. Richard really didn't want to cut any of the script. And so what we had was a script that needed 12 weeks and he was going off in an eight-week shoot. Um, I left that production because we couldn't agree on the production strategy. They had their eight weeks pre-production after a week's filming. Uh, after five days filming, they were four days behind. So the die was cast in pre-production that they were actually setting off on an unrealistic shooting strategy. And I got, they fired the first assistant director and the completion guarantors brought me back as assistant director to try and get it back on track. And I said, look, we can't get it back on track. The problem is it's, the script is way over length. You've either got to have less coverage or you've got to lose some script pages. So the painful process there was that Richard was not prepared to lose any of the pages He'd storyboarded things that uh, a scene that might have, you know, 120 shots. The day's 10 hours long. The most shots you get on, with a crew of that size might be 20. And so he was getting far less shots. And so he he was covering the scenes with less coverage, which means they wouldn't work as well. And he eventually had to start ripping out pages. So it was I can understand him saying it was an unpleasant experience but he created the experience by not heeding you know, uh, the reality that the script was way over and for an action film, action requires ma many more cuts. It also had a, a very large night component and night takes twice as long to shoot as day. And yes, there were long periods when you've got enormous lighting setups at night with semi-trailers screaming around streets that you have to lock them down. Yes, you have to stop uh, filming in the middle of a take if there is a dangerous situation. So I think that Richard found it a very difficult situation uh, being forced to cut the script. But I think um, uh, in future, he, you know, if someone says the script is way over, he should, he should uh, he, heed the warning.